Hey, it's Kat here, back to talk to you about methods. Methods are reusable blocks of code that are written to perform specific tasks. So what we're going to start with is looking at a program and identifying some methods and then talking about how methods can be written. Here we have a dinky little program called Name Input and what it does is it has a text field and a submit button and somebody will enter their name and then it will accept that name and print it out on the screen. Okay, but irrespective of that, uh, we're actually really just looking at this piece of code to identify the methods. Now what we do is we start looking inside the class. So the class is up the top and it means that everything inside its curly brackets are the program. And we are looking for methods and they will usually start with the word public or private. So we can see here public something or other, public something or other, and public something or other. Now all methods have the same structure. They have the access modifier, the return type, the name, the parameters in the brackets if there are any, and some open and closed brackets in which the body of the method is, uh, is to be found. So in just a stock standard program, we typically have public void init and public void paint. And we can also often find public void action performed. And they are default Java methods that we can use. And we do use them quite a bit. Now paint, uh, paint stuff on the screen. Action performed responds to user generated event. And in it, it is used for initializing all the objects and components that's used in a particular program. So let's look at just one of those and break down all the parts of the method definition. So we're going to start with the method paint. It doesn't matter which method we had picked, they all have the same structure. So let's start by looking at the word public. The word public is the access modifier. So if you make it public, it means that that method can be used anywhere within that program but also if you have a program which uses multiple classes, then it is accessible to all. If you use private or protected, it restricts which other methods and classes can call that, that one method that you've written. For the moment, we're just going to stick with public. Our second thing here is void. And the word void here is our return type. And the return type is the information that the method gives back to us when it is finished executing. So if we had a method that took some numbers, it did some calculation on them and it returned the result to us, then if those numbers had been whole numbers, our return type would have been int. If it was answering a true or false question, it would have returned a boolean. If it was returning a character, we would have had public char. And maybe if we were having uh, doing some string manipulation, it would have been public string. So you always write the, the type of information that the method gives back to you. If it gives you back nothing but just does stuff, like paint does, you would put the return type as void. Okay, the next part in our method definition is the name. The name of the method here is paint. It's always a good idea to give a method a name that has some indication of what that method is doing. So if we're painting stuff on the screen, paint's a pretty good name for it. Uh, if we were taking three numbers and adding them together, then maybe sum would be a good name for it. Typically method names start with a lowercase letter. If the name has multiple words in it, the first word will be a lowercase letter and every word after that will start with an uppercase letter. That's just sort of convention but not rule. Uh, the next thing we need to look at is that we've got a set of brackets here and the brackets take the formal parameters. The formal parameters are the bits of information that your method needs to be able to complete its job. So for paint to be able to draw stuff, it needs a graphics object. And what you do is you declare that type, so graphics G, and that little G is an object that becomes local to the paint method. Uh, you don't need to have parameters, but you must have those brackets irrespective of whether there is something in them or not. Okay, so formal parameters define what type of information you have to give that method for it to be able to do its job. The last thing that we have for any method is the body. So everything that fits inside those braces 
is the body of the method, so what it's doing in order to complete its set task. Now, if we had a return type, we would have had to have at the bottom a statement that said return, and then the variable or value we wanted to return, provided that was the same type as we said we would be giving back. Okay, so that's the breakdown. We've got the access modifier, the return type, the name, the formal parameters, and then the body of the method. So let's just have a crack at writing our own. And yeah, so we'll, we'll write our own and follow these sets of rules and discuss it along the way. Okay, so I've given us a little task there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna write a method to accept two numbers and return their sum. Thinking back to our method definition, or the parts of a method that we need to write is we first of all need to start with our access modifier. And I said that we're going to start with um, using public for everything. So the first part of our method is the word public. Now we've said that we wanna return the sum of two numbers. At some point we then need to decide are we working with whole numbers or are we working with uh, decimals? And I'm just gonna work with uh, whole numbers for the moment. So I'm going to say that it will return to me an int. Okay, so what is the method doing? We need to think about that before we give our method a name. It's calculating a sum, so maybe I will just call it sum. <coughs> and then I need to have the brackets. And inside the brackets, I need to identify what type of information that method needs to be able to do its job. I've said here that it's going to accept two numbers and and we just talked about it, we were gonna use whole numbers, so I need to define that it will take an integer. We'll call that n, comma, whenever you have more than one parameter, you separate them with a comma, and we might also have integer m. Okay, close bracket. So they're my formal parameters. Then I have a set of curly braces, which I'm terrible at drawing. Okay. So what we need to do inside of our method is we need to add the two numbers together. So we might have integer result. So we say we're gonna have an integer, it's gonna be called result. Then we need to calculate the result. So the result is equal to, and we're taking n and we're taking m. So we have n plus m. And then we want to return the result to the user. Okay, so that's that method. And we could use that method multiple times to calculate who knows how many sums. And that's fantastic, but let's have a quick look at how we would actually use it. So in our public void paint, probably, uh, we need to know how we would call this method. So it returns a number to us. So we need to be ready to accept that number. So we might declare, and this is obviously in paint as I said, we might declare in answer. And then we say equals, because remember that when we call sum, it's gonna give us the information back. So we call the method sum, and then we give it the actual parameters, so the actual values it's going to replace n and m with. So let's say four comma seven, and that will, what it will do is it'll jump out of paint. This, this bit is a method call. It jumps out of paint and it pops up to here in our code. And it will replace the N with four. And it'll replace the M with seven. Then it will create a variable called result. It'll add the four and the seven. So four and seven in my book is 11. So it will set result to 11 and it will return the number 11 back to me. And so in here, my answer will equal 11. So what happens when you have a method call is it jumps out of paint or wherever you've called it from, it executes the whole method and then it returns the value back to where it was called from and then you continue on with your program. So we'll have a quick look at how to code that on the computer and just test it out. And we might do it with two text fields so that we can see that it works for any numbers that we give it. Okay, so we've got our Eclipse open. I've just created a new 
Java project called Methods and I've created a new class called Own Methods where I'm learning how to write my own methods. So as I said, we were going to have a little program that would allow us to add two numbers together and output their result. So the first thing that I'm going to do is set up my graphical user interface. So I'm going to have two text fields and a button. We'll do action performed first. So action performed, we need to accept the values from those text fields. So I'm going to need to have two integers and I'm going to call them A and B. <clears throat> and here I'm going to have A is equal to user input A dot get text. And I'm going to have B is equal to user input b dot get text okay let's see what's going on ah okay so when it gets text out of a text field obviously it is a string so we need to change it to an integer so integer dot parse int we'll fix that one up And then we, what, what we want to do is we're going to repaint the screen. Okay, so in paint, what we would do is maybe have a drawstring and say that the result is, and then we're going to add on our result. And we're going to put it at 20, 100 or wherever we would like. And now we're starting to think about the fact that, oh, we don't have anything for our method yet. And what we said was to get the answer from our method, we would have result equals, we'll call the method, and we're going to pass it those two numbers. So we're going to pass it A and B. Uh, and it is an integer. Now it's telling me I don't know what sum is. And we haven't written our method sum yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop it down the bottom. But really, it can be anywhere in my program because it will only ever be called, so it will only ever execute, when I call it. So you can have 20 methods in a program and not use them, uh, and it doesn't matter what order they're written in because they will only execute when they are called, and other than that, they will sit dormant. Okay, so the method that we described before, we said we were going to say public, and it was going to give us a sum back. So it was going to give us an integer and we called it sum and we gave it two parameters int n and int m and then in the body we need to calculate our result. Now it is telling me I've got an error. Now if I hover over it, it will say that I must return a result of type int. So I must have the statement return something. Okay, so we'll finish that in a moment. Okay, so what we had is we had somewhere to store the answer as we're doing our calculations. And our answer is equal to n plus m. And then we are going to return our answer. So what that does is when we submit the information to our text fields, it assigns the two numbers to a and b. So a and b point to values and what happens is when we call the method we copy the value of a into the value of n and we copy the value of b into the value of m. Now a and b never change their values and we can find that out or we can double check that by actually printing out what their values are. So we may as well print them out just so we can see what's happening. Okay, 
Okay, so let's just run that. Hopefully there's no mistakes. I've done it in a bit of a rush. So at the moment, the result is nothing and A and B are nothing. So let's enter in 4 and 7, just like we did with the, uh, with the example before. And we'll submit that. We can see that 4 is assigned to A and B is assigned to 7 and that the result is the two added together. Before I forget, let's also just try that same applet with a few other numbers. So let's say we gave it 78 and 102. We can see again that A and B get the values from the text fields and they don't change even though we use them to calculate the result. So let's try big numbers. Okay, so it's still doing the job just fine. Let's give it something easy. Um, and let's see what happens if we give it some decimals. Okay, so it didn't work. And that's because we programmed it to work with whole numbers. And in here, we have also specified that we want those as integers and so it hasn't coped brilliantly with the decimal numbers. Now it's important to also realize that because n and m are the parameters for this method, n and m don't exist anywhere else in the program. So if I was to say n equals n plus m up here, it would tell me that those variables don't exist. Okay, so it cannot be resolved to a variable that's because they are local to my method called sum. Okay, so it's important to realize that that is its own compact little unit. It will take some numbers and calculate a result, but these variables that are used do not exist anywhere other than in that method. And that means that uh, what you can do is you can copy and paste that into almost any program and be guaranteed it's still going to work because we can read from the method definition what we need to give it. Okay, so we know we need to, when we use it, we need to give it two values and we can expect a result back. I'd also like to mention that um, this method could have been written much more simply. What we could have done is had int a, b and answer. And we could have just had this one to be answer equals n plus m and not return anything because it's modifying a global variable. And then what we could have had equals, sorry, is uh, sum of A and B. It would have produced the result and we could put in answer just there. Now that uses the global variable, I'll just collapse that so it's not in the way. That uses the global variable answer, which, you know, this works nice and simply and it's fairly easy to read. The only thing is now if you took this method and you copied and pasted it into another program, you're actually expecting that the user knows that they have to have a global variable called answer. And one of the other problems with that is that we could just randomly change the value of answer and It means that if we're not paying attention, we could modify our code in ways that we don't intend to. So we've got there, result is blah, blah, blah. Let's put in some numbers. And result is 13. A is 4, B is 9, and result is 300. So if I accidentally had, didn't have that first result, and we just had this answer equals 300, we would run the program and we would enter in our 4 and our 9 and we'd get the result back and we'd say jeepers creepers a plus b 4 plus 9 does not equal 300. So by using a global variable we open ourselves up to accidentally modifying the information but also it means that it is not as modular so we can't copy and paste that into anything and know that that it will just work. Uh, so by having the previous design of returning an int and let's say return m plus m. So now you've also seen me do this in an easier way.
We've now made this one just a little bit neater. So this can be copied and pasted into anything and we only need to know that part to be able to figure out how to use that method. Okay, so try and stay away from using global variables. Use things that are local to the method that you're writing to make it more modular, to make it more independent. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to leave it there. And if you want, have a look at the next chapter for some more complex methods.